So whoever just came in, my name is Melissa. I'm the ambassador for Nevada. Um, thanks for coming. I'm going to go over just a very brief intro to taxidermy, what I know, because I don't know everything. I'm very novice, so, but I've, I've been into taxidermy for a long time, and I've done a lot of things. Some of it's turned out good, some of it not so much, but um, I feel like, you know, everybody could just delve into it and create something with a couple of tries with a little bit of information. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started if we're all ready. I'm going to go over an introduction of who I am a little more in depth, um, go over a very brief history of taxidermy, getting and then get into dermestid beetles or care or setup, where I got my beetles, anything else that you guys might have questions over and then cleaning skulls because the point of having domestic beetles is to clean skulls afterwards. So um, moving on. So I was raised in Wichita, Kansas, and I uh, moved to Nevada about three years ago. I grew up with a tremendous love for the outdoors starting at a very young age. I think I was four years old holding that bullfrog and that picture with the rattlesnake is last year when I was a park ranger at La Hontan State Park. We had an unwelcome visitor in a campground and I removed it and everybody was fine. I got a biology natural resources degree from Jorge State University and I currently am an environmental technician for a copper mine in Yarrington, Nevada. So I help maintain their compliance with the Nevada Department of Environmental Protection. So it's a very busy job. Um, I've been hunting since I was five years old. I shot my first deer when I was 12. I've hunted a lot of different species, more than what's pictured here. I've mostly deer and turkey hunted, but I've waterfowl hunted. I'll hunt just about anything and eat also just about anything. So, um, yeah, it's a huge passion of mine. And with hunting, you know, you naturally, at least I did, gravitate towards taxidermy. It's super freaking expensive. So I started doing it myself to try to cut the cost. Um, you really are paying for that person's artwork, not the materials. The materials are relatively cheap in terms of what you pay for your entire mount. Um, so I got into that myself and um, like I said, I've done some good things, but um, some of it's turned out bad, but um, you know, it's all about finding your niche. There's people who specialize in cats, there's people who specialize in birds, um, and then there's people who specialize in mammals, which tend to be easier than birds or cats. Cats are their own thing, and um, I, if you guys ever get a cat mounted, I would suggest that you do your, your research on the and be picky, so who <laughs> you get it mounted by. Um, very, very few pictures of taxidermy that I've done. I have more in, my, in the room with me that I can physically show you. Um, this was one of my first pheasant mounts on the left there that I made for my cousin's first pheasant. It's just a dead mount. They're imperfect mounts as it is. So super easy to do. I stuffed it with cotton. I wouldn't suggest necessarily doing that, putting a form in it would be better. The little, they're kind of a, a hard styrofoam insert. Um, they're actually made, it's like a spray foam or something. I don't exactly know what the material is, but it's just, a, it's really lightweight and helps keep the form of that, um, the animal a lot better. And then I've done a lot of turkey taxidermy. Um, super easy, anybody can do that. Um, the only thing you're really gonna need is borax, which you can get at Walmart, or it's in the laundry detergent aisle. Um, and it's a degreaser and it dries out the skin of a bird. So specifically upland birds, I would not use it on ducks. Um, ducks are very oily, whereas your upland birds, like a turkey and grouse and things like that are kind of like a chicken. So they have like a drier skin, they're not as oily. They don't have to float on water. So all you need to do is um, you know, scrape the skin off, get as much meat off of that as possible and, um, sprinkle that borax on. And then I let it sit for six weeks and you don't have to put the wings. You can see the wing on that one's kind of screwed up, but, um, you position the wings the way you want it. And then you kind of put it back together with, you know, knowing the anatomy of the animal that you butchered. Um, and you know, that was 
one of my first big gobblers that I ever shot. So um, it's pretty awesome to do, very, very easy. I would be happy if upon request someone wanted me to actually do a tutorial. I need a turkey for that because I haven't shot a turkey in like three years. So um, there's no, not really a lot of turkey in Nevada, <laughs> unfortunately. So just a real quick history on taxidermy. Taxidermy comes from the Greek words taxis and derma. So the word taxis means order, preparation, and arrangement, and derma means skin. So I have a question. Whoever wants to blurt out an answer, um, who do we think the first taxidermists were? Anybody wants to guess? Don't be afraid. I didn't know until I looked it up on Google. So. Egyptians. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy you got it. That is so awesome. Everyone I've asked is like says something different. So I'm like super stoked you got it. My boyfriend was like, uh. so yes, it was Egyptians. They developed the first preservation methods to uh, preserve a lot of the different animals that lived in the environment with them, their pets, and their people. So, and you know, we They've done a good job because we're still finding those things in relatively good shape thousands of years. Um, and then taxidermy kind of evolved a little bit, I guess, um, later on from a less practical purpose. Um, we had the, uh, ancient Europe, they had hide tanning for clothing. So again, practical, they needed that. They needed to tan these hides so they could keep warm during colder weather, or cover themselves up and then Indigenous people of North America. Um, they also have a little bit more decor um, involving animal parts um, for their really like elegant headdresses and um, among other things. Um, and then we move into modern taxidermy, which was more so you start seeing that in the 18th century. Um, and back then, taxidermy wasn't necessarily good. And um, I use the lion of Gripsham as a great example of that. This was a lion um, that was gifted to the king of Sweden in the 1700s, early 1700s, and he wanted it preserved. So he gave it to a taxidermist who had never seen a lion before. <laughs> and um, he, its teeth were made of wood and tongue was made of wood. It didn't have a form in it. He used the bones. I have no idea what he used to create the shape. All in all, for someone who's never seen a lion before, it looks decently well, like a cartoon character, but um, you know, it could be worse, I suppose, for somebody who's never seen a lion before. And then you get into our really beautiful works of art that we have today. Um, this is actually my, my dear mount. I did not make this, this was a friend of mine who mounted it for me. I'm not willing to screw up my own shoulder mount yet. So, um, but you start seeing like really awesome like masterpieces um, with uh, taxidermy. I sent my cat to a gentleman named Phil Susie in Libby, Montana. He is a world renowned cat, cat taxidermist. That's why I said be picky with your cats. You're gonna pay for it, but you get what you pay for. Um, people who want to spend their time on it and are really um, passionate about their artwork that they create and this is their their livelihood you don't want um someone who's going to do it super fast um he's had the cat for over a year i cannot wait to get it back i have no idea what it looks like but um i uh um you know and, and the same with ducks ducks are very very difficult they're oily they're not as dry skinned as a pheasant or anything like that so they require a different form of preparation, um, which I've attempted to do and failed. So I don't mess with ducks at this point in time <laughs> anymore. Um, I, I So I'm gonna get into the domestic beetles, which is where I'm really, really interested in and where I've kind of focused my this point in time. Um, it does evolve when you get into taxidermy, you start like wanting to do everything and then you kind of like, hone in on what you think is going to be your specialty and what you um, are going to be good at. You'll figure out what you're good at and what you're not good at and what you have patience for, <laughs> and which is a lot of taxidermy's patience and, and looking at like delicate um, details of an animal to recreate that in a lifelike way. So 
Dermestid beetles are a flesh-eating beetle. Um, they uh, go through three stages of life and the, you want the larva, you want pupa and you want adults. The, the adults um, produce those larva and the larva are what do the majority of the eating in your colony. Um, pupas are kind of useless until um, you know they develop and turn into something that actually eats. Um, but you want a lot of larva more so than the adults. The adults are just for the breeding purposes. Um, so this is my setup for my domestic beetles. It is not fancy, it is ugly, it looks disgusting because be those beetles are actually really kind of disgusting. They smell bad. Um, I keep their tank pretty clean. I give them fresh water on those sponges. Um, and their nesting material is actually that styrofoam. They do, that's what I, read up on. I would like to find something that isn't styrofoam, but they actually eat it too. So um, I guess it does kind of go away. But they they lay their eggs in there and the little, I mean, it kind of looks like a little bee. You'll see like this, the, the end of it sticking out of a hole that it's been chewed in there. Um, so for a deer skull, which I'm sure a lot of you guys are interested in, you're going to need 3,500 plus or like size colony um in a 40 gallon aquarium which is what i have here in mine and it needs to be glass these beetles climb and you do not want them getting out <laughs> um so and what i did with my um my column or my tank is i used just a regular like tank i cut the silicone off the corners because they will climb up that and get out and they actually did in my house and was i was finding them and i was freaking out. Um, and then I also put um, Vaseline around the top just in case. <laughs> so, um, and uh, paper shreds for the bedding, super easy, get them from work or wherever. And um, that it's great. It's absorbent, cooling blood in there. They'll, they're not the smartest creatures. They'll drown in it. Um, and you can tell that this antelope skull that's in there is incredibly dried out because I do not have 3,500 beetles. I was just impatient and wanted to see what would happen. And it smelled terrible, I'll tell you what. Because when you don't have enough beetles to clean the skull, you know, it starts to decompose and stink. And the more beetles you have, the faster they get before it starts to decompose. Um, and I have about a thousand. How many, how do you estimate how many you need for whichever, yeah, whatever size skull you're cleaning? Um, so I would say small schools. I mean, like I said, I bought a thousand to start and that'll clean like a lot of like small schools. So I started do putting bird skulls in there. And this is my swan. If you guys saw the picture of my swan. I put this in there and they ate this in about two days. Um, really, really fast. Didn't stink at all. Um, and then I also have a bag of and I started out with much smaller skulls and kind of increased because, I mean, your colony will grow over like six months or so. Um, I just kind of started to increase the, the size of the skulls that I would give to them. Um, so, you know, I, I was giving them duck skulls because I have this, for some reason, I really want to make a shadow box with all these duck skulls and like label their scientific name and do male and female. Um, if there's any morphology difference in their skulls at all but um you know these are just duck skulls and other waterfowl skulls i did uh and they ate them in just a couple days so um with um my marmot skull this probably took them a week or next days to um get into and um they have like marmots and beavers they have like massive freaking muscles on their jaws so um, I would recommend cutting as much meat off as you can for a faster clean. Um, and I did that with the beaver. I cut these big meaty chunks off and then as well as my, my boyfriend's mountain lion skull, like, I mean, this was all just like, there was muscle just like sticking out of the here. And, um, you know, it took this, as you can see, like, this isn't completely clean, um, but that's as clean as it's going to get from my beetles. So I, um, 
you know, if the meat gets dried out on there, they can't chew it up and they need a fresh meal. So um, this probably took two to three weeks for them to do, which is a really long time and longer than I wanted to wait. So, um, but you know, that's, you just kind of learn as you go. I have like some really swanky skulls in here that I'm dying to show off. Like um, I shot a snipe this year um, and like cleaned its skull. And I just think it's so cool because like it reveals like, just like, I don't know, the coolest little features that you just, you wouldn't think if that's what it looks like underneath there. And then um, I showed you this, the Sandhill Crane that I shot. I have, um, I cleaned my Sandhill Crane. And these are uh, Sandhill Crane skulls. And these are just right out of the beetle tank, pretty much. They aren't like, um, degrees they haven't been through any other process other than my beetles eating them eating the flesh off of them and the great thing about beetles is that they um get in those nooks and crannies that maybe would be hard to get to if you just decide to boil the skull um boiling the skull is a super easy option but um you know there there's um you know meat uh, that's all the way up into the sinuses. That's really hard to get to. And I personally like preserving the um, nasal bones that are inside of, you know, an animal's nostrils. I think it's super cool to have that, but you know, you'll see people who boil them that just pull it straight out because they can't get all the meat out from it and beetles can. So, um, I mean, and it's not as harsh on the bone to, um, when you boil a skull, it, I mean, it compromises the integrity of the bone structure. So um, it gets brittle and um, it's just, um, you know, no, I don't know. I mean, people do it, but I think, you know, the less stress you put on the, the, the skull, the better. So, um, but yeah, I bought my beetles on eBay. So um, if anybody's wondering where to get them, they're super easy to get hold of. You can buy them on Etsy too, I think. Um, and uh, I, uh, there was $110 for a thousand beetles. Um, and I'm probably going to order more because I want to stick a deer skull and they're so bad. And I want to do a time lapse of it. I think they're super awesome animals. Um, anyways, the bedding, you just paper shreds, there's nothing complex. Um, water, Give, them, give it to them in a sponge so they don't drown. Temperature is really important with these guys. Um, you don't want them really under 65 degrees because you'll lose productivity. Um, and they do start dying obviously at freezing temperatures, but you don't want them too hot either because then the beetles start flying. <laughs> so um, if you keep them between like 65 and 70, it's like perfect for them for productivity. And um, you don't want beetles flying out of your thing everywhere. I personally don't. Um, and they like it dark. They're nocturnal. So they, um, if you turn the light on, it's crazy. It's just like scurry when you turn the light on. And then another important thing is um, keeping pests out of your tank. You do not want um, like parasites or anything getting on their mites um, because that could be um, uh, detrimental to your colony. Are you so, <laughs> Sorry. Um, and uh, so I, uh, anyways, pests, you want to put like some sort of, uh, I put mesh over the top of my um, uh Sorry, he threw me through. I put mesh over the top of the aquarium on top, which is underneath the lid as well, um, so that like flies can't get in there and lay their eggs on the rotten flesh, which is what they're going to want to do if you have it um, in an area that flies have access to it. So, um, yeah, I I think I ripped like the the mesh off of the bottom of a mattress. If you can see that on the top of the picture and used it, so they can still breathe through it, but nothing else can get through it. Um, cause it'll decimate your colony, but they'll just take over and die. Um, any questions on the beetles? I feel like I did a lot of research on it. I got a lot of my information on a bajillion different websites on, um, the internet and kind of learned as I went.
Melissa Ashlyn asked, how, how were the Beatles shipped? So how did you receive them? In a box. <laughs> um, they shipped them in a box. Um, there was, I might have had a plastic container in it. I've had them for over a year. I think maybe there was a plastic container with holes in it, and then it was also inside of a box with um, with shreds in it, and it had some styrofoam in there as well, um, which I just threw in there with it. Sorry, how do I look at um, these? Uh, oh, chat. Here we go. Sorry, guys. How long did the Beatles um, shipped, or how long were the did the Beatles live? I truly don't know what their life expectancy is. I mean, there's dead ones in there, but I raise a couple different types of beetles. So I also raise darkling beetles because they produce super worms and I wanna, I feed them for, to my chickens and my reptiles as well. So um, the darkling beetles live for months. So, um, and identifying everything in the aquarium. One second here, <laughs> the middle is an analog skull um and it's kind of gross <laughs> crap i totally forgot to upload i had a cool video of my beetles like in the skin like eating on it um and uh on the left bottom there and um there's uh, a raccoon skull uh, one that i trapped that was getting into people's houses through their doggy door um, and then on the other three corners are pieces of styrofoam, which is their nesting material. And then on top of that, I have just like these simple little sponges for um, uh, their water. And then just paper shreds for the bedding. And what would you feed them if you don't have a skull to feed, to give to them, which is a great question. Um, meat, <laughs> any kind of meat. They'll also eat rotting vegetables. Um, they, uh, uh, but yeah, if you, you can just cut up a piece of meat, maybe even an egg yolk, I don't really know, but, um, yeah, any kind of, uh, flesh, they like flesh. So, um, and brains are particularly good for them. So, um, <laughs> but if you're short on brains, just cutting like a, dropping a couple pieces of ground venison or ground turkey or anything like just ground meat or even just like the scraps that's in there. They cannot eat hair and they cannot eat like nails or any like hard structure that has to be, or feathers. They have to, it has to be like just the flesh. Um, so fish, I imagine they don't eat the scales. Um, I don't, I'm sure that they'll eat the insides of the fish. There's a guy on uh, Instagram actually that's um, on, it's a page called Skeletal Articulation and I freaking love his work. Um, there's no way he doesn't have beetles because he is putting complete skeletons of these crazy fish together. Um, and that seems a little more tedious than something I want to get into maybe someday. <laughs> but um, yeah, they'll definitely, uh, I mean, they'll eat the cartilage for sure um, if it's super soft material. <sighs> A couple other Sorry. questions. Uh, yeah, what fine. do you do with the antlers sticking out of the tank? Um, sorry, I just spilled my LaCroix on my keyboard. Um, antlers sticking out of the tank is a difficult one. Um, I haven't, that's why I chose a deeper, um, a deeper tank. You also want to have, you know, your enclosure um, so that it fits what you're going to be putting in there. I fit, I found this super cool bighorn sheep. I haven't put a deer in there yet, but I found this bighorn sheep and put him in there and he fit pretty well. Super cool. These things come off. <laughs> I uh, had to pound them off after I was boiling it, but there. Um, so the beetles, there was some brain goo still in there. So I stuck it in there so they could get the rest of the crap out of there. And, um, I, uh, but it was pretty much bleached already because it was sitting in the Nevada sun for who knows how long. Um, but yeah, um, old refrigerators and deep freezers are awesome. I don't have one of those that I can dedicate to it yet, but, um, yeah, I, uh, I've seen some pretty awesome setups on YouTube 
that people do and they put fans in there and yes they smell awful um if you if they they just stink i mean when you think about you know what they're defecating it's what they ate which isn't it's rotting flesh so <laughs> um next up let me get out of that and so after you get your beetles set up and have all of that going um you want to clean your skull right because the point of having beetles is to have um is to clean skulls well you know um people um will use them i mean i'm pretty sure that crime labs use them for um cleaning human bones as well so um but um as far as supplies go you don't need anything fancy i bought crap sorry guys um, I bought that for 20 bucks from this guy that lived here um, for cleaning skulls, but I would recommend having something that you could dial it, di or excuse me, dial the heat setting on it, because that just has one setting, and you don't want to boil your skulls. You want to simmer them. Um, you don't want them at a rolling boil, um, and it's very difficult to do that with that specific setup, but it does has done the job. <laughs> so um, I use a 50-50 40 uh, peroxide, it's 40% peroxide. So like the stuff you get at the hair salon, I bought a gallon jug of it for 30 bucks on Amazon. Um, 40, 40 volume peroxide and water. Um, but before you get into the bleaching and degreasing part, you wanna make sure all the meat is off your skull. So I'm um, giving it a little bit of a simmer in just plain old water to get the any kind of loose particles that need to come off off first and then you'll get a better product when you put um put it into the degreasing solution which is what turns it that nice white so um this is an example is you know my boyfriend's lion skull um this is um you know not beautiful solid white like my beaver skull my beaver skull is crazy white but it was this color. So with the 40 volume peroxide, um, it really um, helps get those oils out of the pores of the, the bone and uh, kind of turns it into a nice bright white skull. Um, <clears throat> the 40 volume peroxide is extremely strong. Um, I did get it on my skin. I suggest you wear gloves. I did the second time. Um, <laughs> But um, it, it is peroxide, it will bubble up your skin a little bit. And um, safety glasses for um, any kind of chemical, use safety glasses, super important. I just have these cheapo little safety glasses that you use for shooting. Um, but uh, you know, there's a lot of caustic chemicals that they use in taxidermy for preserving bird feet. And um, uh, it's definitely recommended. You don't wanna get that crap in your eye. Um, and then you, know, you could even go as far as wearing a mask because um, it, well, I mean, if you're breathing in those fumes, that can't be good. Um, tools, um, just specifically for cleaning um, skulls. Um, I bought this cool handy dandy little wire brush. So when I'm boiling my girlfriend's mountain lion skull, I can help work this stuff loose and um, get the extra little bits of flesh off. Um, and you don't want to scrub super hard. Um, you want to not scratch the bone itself. Um, an exacto knife set is an absolute must if you get into taxidermy. You are going to need it for splashing your skulls. You're going to need it for um, getting. Taxidermy is gross. It's, it's gross. You're picking the eyeballs out. You're picking the brain out. Um, you're skinning it away, and you're cutting into parts of the animal you wouldn't normally see if you were just cleaning it for, um, you know eating it, um, but the brains and the eyeballs are kind of gross and you're gonna be working with them if you're gonna be cleaning skulls. Um, and I'm weird, um, I like to find dead animals. Like this beaver was a mountain lion skull or mountain lion kill um, and it was dead already when I found it. Um, and I've found beings on the side of the road which are already stink um, and taken them home and cleaned their skulls up. And um, <laughs> it's, it's smelly and gross and brains are weird and eyeballs are weird. Um, I wear gloves for that, for sure. Because um, you also just don't know what kind of uh, bacteria you're going to run into, especially on a dead, an a dead animal. Um, you know, if you end up doing this for somebody, you don't know how they've handled it in the field, how long it's been sitting out, the bacteria growth on it. People can get some very nasty infections and lose fingers from it. I've seen pictures. <laughs> so, um, 
Going back to a knife set, um, I get my blades on Amazon. Amazon's your best friend. I got a cheap am uh, knife that's got two different sizes of knives in it for um, from Walmart. Um, and the rest of it's kind of just as an as needed basis. So um, I'll show you. I got this uh, clay kit that I use because um, you know the teeth are going to fall out when you boil. Uh, or when you simmer it. And I would suggest getting the teeth out as quickly as you can because they do get brittle and they break um, on this beaver skull. I don't know if you guys can see that, but it's split there and I had to glue it back together. This is the best glue ever, E600. It's kind of a silicone based glue, but um, it dries clear. Um, and I kind of use this clay, clay kit that I got on Amazon as well, um, originally for baking the cake, but it got turned into taxidermy tools. Um, for kind of like, you know, fine details with the glue, because I don't want to see the glue. If I were paying customer, I wouldn't want to see evidence of glue or anything like that on something that I paid money for, um, which is ultimately my goal. I want to become a taxidermist. I would totally love to get into that, um, but I want to be good at it before I have someone paying for it. Um, and then, um, so once you get the teeth out and then you get it bleached, because you don't need to bleach the teeth either, and that will also degrade the teeth even more. Um, there's no set time on, um, how, um, how long you simmer. Um, it's until the flesh is off and then it's until it's the desired whiteness that you want. Um, different skulls are going to hold different uh times so a beaver or something small is not going to take as long this my duck or my swan skull very fragile you also want to be very careful um with how long you do that because the bones will just disintegrate um so um whereas something dense like a mountain lion is probably going to take a few hours um to get you know completely white um so it's you know and also with the bottom jaw when you're simmering, it, it will likely come apart on that suture right there. So um, easy fix. This one did it too, and I fixed it. And you can't even tell that I glued it, except for maybe on a little tiny part. Um, so, uh, but yeah, that's kind of my process in a nutshell. Um, I probably skipped something. I usually am drinking beer when I do this. So, um, and, uh, you know, other work that I've done, um, I just did... I don't know if you guys have ever heard of a crown mount. They're kind of a uh, a vintage um, a vintage type of mount. You must have seen this like on your grandpa's wall or something. Um, I know my grandpa had these, and um, my boyfriend's dad had a bunch of skull caps in the basement in a box. He's got a crap ton of them. This was just one of them, and he wanted it fixed up. So the antlers were all faded. Um, Basically, what you do, super easy, if you have a nice buck or any buck at all, um, you cut it down. <laughs> These are not my hearts, so if they break, I'd be in trouble. Um, you cut it like this. And so this is a white tail, the other one was a mule deer, but you kind of just cut a nice narrow um, thing between around the antlers. And then the form is this and again it's called a crown mount oh sorry i missed a question i'll get to it in just a moment and it kind of just fits in there and then um sorry um you use um epoxy sculpt to kind of form the shape and then the uh leather goes over the top of it and um, with fabric glue and Again, I bought the background, the little wood uh, thing there is from Etsy. So let me kind of just fix on there like that. Um, teeth, which ones go where? Um, Tanya asked. Um, so teeth only go in one spot. <laughs> so you're not going to mistake which tooth goes where. The thing with bones, if it doesn't go easy, you're probably putting it in the wrong area. Um, yeah, all these teeth fell out Then it took me a minute to figure out which ones go where and then I laid them in order, put a little dab of glue on it and stuck it back down in there. So, um, yeah, it's not too hard. The crazy thing about these beaver skulls, um, is their teeth, like their incisors, like go way back into here. Like they're, 
This, there's so much more to this tooth than what you see. Um, pull the teeth with forceps. Um, forceps or like hemostats. I don't have hemostats. I think that's a very necessary tool to have. Um, so um, you get almost any of these tools on Amazon or, um, but yeah, pull the teeth with hemostats. They're very fragile. Um, they can break fairly easy. Um, with my marmot, I even lost a few of his teeth because they're super, super freaking tiny. And um, yeah, so I uh, don't have all of the teeth for this guy, but you know, you kind of just learn as you go um, on what am I going to do different the next time uh, with and make it go better and kind of turn it into a better product. And then the very final thing you do to a skull. And this is probably the weirdest thing I've ever heard, but this is what this guy on YouTube, a couple people on YouTube use to finish their skulls and kind of seal it off for presentation, um, you know, to fill in the port of the skulls and kind of give it a nice um, clear coat, matte clear coat is mopping glue. <laughs> um, you can also use Mod Podge matte. You don't want a shiny skull, right? So, um, but this is a pretty inexpensive and he just paints it on the skull with um a cheap cheap paintbrush i used this right before we got on this meeting and kind of did a i did a layer on this beaver skull and it's not shiny um and you want a real nice thin layer on there if you put two layers on there it does turn shiny you, so if you want shiny antlers or shiny skulls then i guess do that but um <clears throat> so that's uh kind of the final step is that and then you know hanging it on a plaque of your choice or setting it on the shelf or, you know. Uh, the glue is E600. Um, if you type E600 glue into Google, it'll pop up. Clear, transparent, it's a kind of silicone and gooey. Um, and it comes with these awesome little nozzles that go on the end of it to help not explode it everywhere. Cause I really, I make a mess when I do things, I'm not, I'm not neat when I'm baking or anything like that. I make a freaking mess. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, you know, I, I mentioned that I stained antlers. Um, one product I would not recommend is um, I bought this because it's called Antler Stain off of McKenzie's. They're kind of a renowned taxidermy supply website. Um, it's not really stained. It just kind of sits on there and you can wash it right back off. It worked okay on that, but getting a nice level tone was difficult. So the next thing I'm going to try is just a light colored wood finish on my white tail antlers. Um, and I'll, I'll see how it turns out, but I've seen people use coffee grounds. I've done really cool coffee ground antlers before. Um, and yes, mopping glow. And that's just the very last thing you want to do to it um, to kind of create a, a matte finish over the top of it. And I do that to my antlers too. I don't put mopping glue necessarily on it, but I got Mod Podge matte finish or any matte clear spray paint will work um, to kind of give it an active coat. And uh, you just don't, I don't like shiny. I see taxidermy and I see shiny antlers and it drives me nuts. So, um, but. Other than that, I mean, I was a crash course. I feel like if I did something like on a video that was a specific process to something, um, you know, I could definitely dish out more information. There's a lot of things overwhelming with when it comes to taxidermy. Um, I've done bird taxidermy. I was just showing this to Carly earlier. My boyfriend and I had some pin race pheasants that. My boyfriend thought he was going to release and they were going to be wild um, with permission of our state wildlife agency. It's, it's notoriously a failure. Um, Stephen Ronella has a podcast on it. It's how pin raised birds do not live in the wild. They just don't have what it takes. So these were the last two that survived and um, I reached out and ate them. And I, I, I mounted the hen and he mounted, I mounted the, um, the rooster for him and uh, borax it's so easy so just start small um and if you have any questions like for sure email me as far as 
and you know afterwards goes. Does anybody else have any other questions? Cami yeah, asked a little bit ago how long you boil each skull. Like, what are the indicators that you look for for when a skull is simmered long enough? So, um, if you're just before you degrease the skull um, with the hydrogen peroxide, you just want the meat to come off. You just want any of the loose particles or just like whatever's left that you don't want on there. So, like gum tissue. Um, you know, muscle tissue, you want that off. Um, and then when it comes to the um, degreasing, it's just to, um, you know, your desired whiteness. Um, you don't want to boil too long and you'll start to see the bone degrade. Um, and you might mess it up the first time. So I suggest practicing on something you don't care about. Um, you know, get if you want to do a deer bone, like a, a femur or a humerus or something, like do that um, instead of doing it on your, your skull. First practice with something. That's why I had I have this humongous bag of bird skulls that I was willing to destroy before I did my boyfriend's mountain lion skull because I did not dare want to mess that up. Um, so once you notice that, you know, it's at the desired whiteness you want, but, you know, you're constantly checking this, looking at it, making sure it's not degrading in other areas. Um, you know, you want it to um, keep in good shape. So, um, you know, just it's, there's no specific set time within the animal. Um, I would say the larger this goal, the longer it's going to take. I mean, it could take upwards of three, four hours. Um, if it, if it's, if you're just sticking the unclean skull in there with meat on it, with, if you haven't done with their rested beetles, which is totally an option, it's going to take even longer. Um, so, but that's not something I've done. Advice on cleaning wings. Um, so as far as like um, turkey wing, yeah, she said, okay, so Candace said she had a deer that took almost six hours and I'm assuming she didn't have beetles for that. So beetles kind of, they're just, a, I don't know. Yeah, beetles are a hobby, I guess. You don't have to have them, but they do help. Um, so wings, is, I mean, wings I would get, uh, like for the turkey wings and the pheasant wings I did, I wish I had was able to show you guys this. Um, I mean, you can kind of see the wing bone in here, probably not from your guys' point of view, but um, I expose the wing bones um, and I get every little bit of meat I can out of there. <laughs> so, um, and I, uh, borax, borax is your best friend. Buy it at Walmart, sprinkle it on there, layer it on there, come back, scrape some more, um, and then, you know, keep reapplying. And eventually once all that meat's off, I mean, even if there's a little bit of meat left on there, it's fine. That borax sucks all the moisture off and it turns into jerky on there pretty much anyway. So, um, you know, you just don't want it to decompose on there because then the integrity of the mount will be sacrificed. So, um, but cleaning wings is easy. And then like, you know, you want to mount them in the way or um, orient them in the way that um, you want it. So I used plywood and nail, like real tiny nails or depending on the size of the wing, you can get away with using push pins and cardboard. Um, which I've used for like my sage grouse tail. I had a, my snipe that I shot. He has the cutest little tail. It's like that big. And I sand it out um, and I haven't mounted it or put it on the wall or anything. It's still on the cardboard, but using push pins to do that. Um, super easy to do. Um, and again, if I had, if someone was willing to send me like their turkey, <laughs> I could mount their turkey for them and show them the process of how it's done. Um, obviously I'm not a professional, so if I mess it up, I apologize, but I well, so will you, will you stop sharing your screen and show them, um, your, uh, yeah, all of the birds, all your specimens that you have? Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, cool. Um, so, um, some things I was going to show you guys, like, like I showed you earlier, I've got, this is the pheasant mount that I did for my boyfriend. I just took some native grass and sage um, to accent it. I mean, you really can be creative with it as much as you want. Um, just, but obviously it's not a native bird, but I like the native flora. So 
it kind of represents the habitat this animal would have been in if it didn't live in a cage, I guess. <laughs> but, um, you know, I just, I've fed them to beautiful birds, so I think they're worth mounting. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, real vegetation is very, very fragile. I spray this with a clear coat just to kind of give it a little bit more stability. But, um, you know, it's, uh, oh, and I got, I got these, these are actually for turkey. These uh, little mounts here, but this insert here is for the beard. <laughs> um, I got them on Etsy. So you can buy freaking weird stuff on Etsy. Let me tell you what. Um, <laughs> you can buy pieces, like random pieces of bones. You can probably, people sell their like own bones from their amputations on there. Not that I'm interested in that, but I've just, you know, you I've Googled like trying to find spare animal parts and come across some very interesting things. Um, you know, like antelope teeth or something is what I was looking up because um, my boyfriend's antelope fell off the wall and I was trying to find replacement teeth for it. Um, but, and then I showed you, what else happened I showed you? One thing I think is fun, I love snakes, so I don't just kill snakes. So I hope you, um, nobody's offended by this, but I've always wanted a hat band out of a rattlesnake. This isn't perfect, but it's a very easy, easy process. If you guys ever get like a rattlesnake, um, out literally rubbing alcohol and glycerin. Um, and, uh, you know, you skin the snake out and you just stick it in a mason jar and soak it in there for, I can't remember, a week, two weeks. And comes out and the scales are all nice and pretty on it. This is a great basin rattlesnake that was in my yard. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, I showed you guys my beaver, showed you guys my pheasant, my marmot skull. Um, and uh, a bighorn sheep, I, I mean, I boiled that and <clears throat> I boiled this just to clean it up. My plan for this is I'm going to beat it. I'm going to put beads on it, like glass beads and a camo pattern. Here you camo pattern. Um, I had to take a rubber mallet to these sheets to get these things off. Um, but I watched a video on YouTube and he hammered on them and I finally got them to pop off. And then you just uh, glue them back on with like Bondo or probably stick silicone up there and do it too. Um, a lot of this information is definitely readily available on YouTube. Um, just one thing that I just drives me nuts is you never see any females doing it. So um, there's one female taxidermist that does a lot of reels on Instagram and I can't remember her name, but she's in Texas and she does beautiful work. So, um, and I follow a lot of, a lot of female taxidermists I think tend to go towards the odd taxidermy realm that I've seen, <laughs> like really bizarre taxidermy. Um, so uh, I've seen some pretty interesting, there's a, on a podcast, this, uh, Stephen Ronella's podcast, one of the girls that um, was on his show was talking about it. And uh, this girl like morphs like different animals together to make like a crow fish goat thing. I don't know. It's weird. <laughs> There's so many, you can get into a deep dark hole with taxidermy. It doesn't just encompass redoing something you've um, harvested. <laughs> so, um, but to each their own, right? I got into this just because I, uh, taxidermy is very expensive. Um, you know, a, a deer mount can cost anywhere from 700 to a thousand dollars for a shoulder mount. Um, most skulls are about 150, depending on the size to do and depending on their process. An area location depends on how much these things cost. Um, you know, I, you know, birds, I mean, depending on the taxidermist too, you know, and the quality of the taxidermist. So like Birdman Studios, he does amazing, amazing work, but you are going to pay for it. Um, there's a guy out of Payson, Utah, um, it's called Stuff and Ducks. A quail is $450, <laughs> so um, very, very expensive. But I mean, again, like I said, you're paying for this person's artwork. Um, so they're really investing their passion into it. And you're gonna get a quality 
um, thing back. So like I said, my bobcat that we sent to Libby, Montana, I did a lot of research and there's a lot of people who said they would only do it for a thousand dollars or eight hundred dollars. And you know, you look at the quality of their work, always look. If you have something, always ask for pictures. So you don't get goofy something back. And uh my cat with shipping and crating and everything ended up costing thirty six hundred dollars. So I did not pay for that. So <laughs> but it like you it can get very expensive and that's kind of why. I got into it my, myself to do like simple things and eventually gear mounts. Sorry, I'm missing out on some uh, chats here. I do not, I free, sorry, I'm gonna go back up a little bit. Um, do I freeze or salt anything or do I only use, so I freeze only until I'm like ready to work with it. Um, I don't use salt. Um, there is methods for using salt on like hides and things like that. But when I'm just drying out bird wings and this is specifically for drying out, if you want something soft, don't use borax because um, it dries it right out and it's going to be like a cracker when you're done with it. Um, so I pretty much only use borax on my birds, like upland birds and things like that. Now you wouldn't want to use necessarily use borax on a full mount um, or anything like that because you want that that flesh to be permeable or um, I can't think of the word, but you want it to be flexible so you can like form it to the actual form. And Marsha uses maceration. I find that to be a very smelly process. Like she said, I've macerated a skull before and it's disgusting. <laughs> um, but yeah, she ties the antlers to the pot for pure control, leave the shade, recover antlers to avoid fading. Yeah. Um, so when you're boiling skulls or simmering skulls, you don't want to get just the antler or anything in the water because um, that will take the color out of your antlers. If you want to keep Ideally, you don't have to stain your antlers, um, but you know, if you find like a bleached antler on the ground, I always think it's fun to like recreate it and make it brown again, which I've done to elk antlers. Um, yeah, and she says um, she uses no need for chemicals or boiling. She leaves it out for a day or two in the sun and naturally bleach out and clean the skull. Um, yeah, so there, like, there's like a 10 different ways to do one thing in taxidermy. Maceration, um, from the little tiny bit of experience as it is, you've got to have, uh, that I've had from it, excuse me. Um, you know, there, you have a pot of water and you want it temperature controlled to promote the growth of bacteria to help remove the flesh. Um, and it stinks. <laughs> but good on you for doing it because I've seen some people macerate skulls and it comes out with a really good looking product. Um, but yeah, and so she says that it, um, you know, depending on the size of the skull, it could take anywhere from two to three months. So you're looking at a decently long process, but you know, if that's what you're into, it's what floats your boat, that's super cool. Um, and uh, what's the easiest animal to taxidermy and what's the hardest? Again, just coming from my own experience, some other people might have different opinions. The easiest animal to like, I'm guessing full body mount, I would say a good place to start and where I plan on starting is um, a deer or yeah, a deer because it's got pretty sturdy hair. Antelope's hair, the pronghorn hair is like hollow styrofoam and goes everywhere and breaks. It's terrible. Um, but yeah, I would say a deer is going to be where I start. Um, they're pretty forgiving. Um, you know, just a general deer mount um, without getting into too much detail with like people get their muscle detail all like crazy. It's so awesome. But, um, you know, I that's where I'm going to start the hardest. Um, again, that's why cats are notoriously difficult. Um, you if you just look at some people's cats and like really take a look at their face. That's uh, what made me so picky about it is like, I don't want the face to be off. And it seems like with cats, faces are 
not the easiest thing to do. Um, and then ducks can be pretty hard too, just because they're a different type of skin than your upland bird. Um, really, really oily. You have to take like a grinder wheel to it and um, like with like a wire brush on it very gently without ripping holes in it and get the flesh off of it because it's like a oil, a very fatty and oily um, bird. And I've attempted to clean a duck before and it was a terrible idea. So, um, but personally, I don't truly know what the hardest and the easiest animal is. I tried to do a pocket gopher and it turned into something from your nightmares. So um, it was horrible. <laughs> yeah, but YouTube's great. It's awesome. There's a lot of tutorials on YouTube, especially for things just as simple as a skull cleaning. Um, you know, and you'll find information from these people and then you'll kind of develop your own knowledge and your own set of skills that work for you that you may not have heard from anybody else. So like everybody there's I follow on Facebook pages, Taxidermy 101. Um, there's so many taxidermy pages I follow on Facebook um, and on Instagram that um, you can learn a lot from those pages. If you like someone posts a question, you read through the feed. I um, mean, you learn a lot that way. So. Oh, I feel like I've done a lot of talking. Um, you know, I, I wish I could show you guys more, um, but I mean, that's kind of just a, a crash course on what I've gotten into and with my experience, which isn't a lot, um, but um, you know, I'm excited to keep doing this and show you guys what I get into. Um, I've got a lot of skulls in my freezer that, you know, I'm just, well, bless my boyfriend. I made him stop on the side of the road in California so I could pick up a dead marmot or a dead mink. And it smelled really bad. So <laughs> check your wildlife regulations um, where you are, because not everything is is legal to pick up either. So um, you know, unprotected species, um, you know, birds especially. Uh, you know, I'm not going to say I haven't picked up a hawk on the side of the road before, but I don't have it anymore. So don't do that. That's federally illegal. It's a felony. Um, you know. Be very careful with things that you're finding and dealing with and have the appropriate um, permits and things to work with certain animals like um, birds, especially um, federally protected birds, eagles, hawks, all that stuff. I do not know anything about gators. <laughs> I wish I did. <laughs> I've always wanted to go hunting, hunt gators. Um, I don't know anything about them at all. I've seen them <laughs> in, uh, Louisiana and Florida, uh, but I have never hunted one. I've always, always, always wanted to go hunting alligator though. It's very expensive for non-residents. So, um, but yeah, I would love to get into reptile taxidermy because I have a huge passion for reptiles and I think it would be super cool to have like museum quality. Um, Cause they, I mean, they're an education tool as well. So, I mean, people who are afraid of snakes can see a snake up close with no fear. Um, you know, I think it's awesome. Any other questions? Uh, <clears throat> no questions anymore? Did I answer everybody's? I mean, anything at all. Um, you know, I can give you my best opinion on certain things, um, but ultimately there's definitely more than one answer to any given question. So yeah, no problem. Thank you guys for, seriously, thank you. I'm glad people showed up. This is my first event. So um, it's kind of nice to get my foot in the door and talk to you guys and introduce myself and kind of show you guys my my interest in taxidermy and dead things. So some people think it's weird, which it might be, but whatever. So <laughs> um, thank you. I appreciate it. You guys have a great evening and I look forward to possibly, maybe I could do a YouTube video or something on it um, for like the whole process, which is a multi-day process. So thank you.